just saw all of you earlier. Um, my name is Amy Dinas. Some of you know me, some of you don't. I'm the Dean of the Academy, and it is um, my pleasure to have our keynote speaker here today um, who's affiliated with the ACAD Postgraduate Teaching Fellowship Retreat, which is why we're all here. Um, this is a phenomenal program that supports and encourages the growth of diversity within faculty of higher education, specifically in art and design programs. We have had a wonderful afternoon during which time each fellow shared some of their work and some of their experiences of, as a new faculty member. Um, my comments are going to be brief. I wanted to introduce the director of uh, the Academy and Museum. Is Chris here? I know he's joining, so we'll give a shout out when he arrives. Um, I also wanted to um, introduce Deborah Obalil. She's the president of ACAD, which is the Association of Independent Colleges of Art and Design. If you could stand up and give a shout. Um, I also wanted to introduce Dr. Rachel Schreiber. She's an associate professor at San Francisco Art Institute. And I would like to introduce Sampada Aranke. She is a, um, in charge of performance studies and assistant professor, art history, theory, criticism department at SAIC. Um, and for those of you that don't know, these uh, three women um, really were the um, energy and muscle behind launching this fellowship program. So um, again, I'm really thankful that we're a part of it and that we can host this retreat this weekend at Cranbrook. Um, I also want to um, have the, the fellows that just presented, if you could stand up and we could acknowledge you. And then my uh, Cranbrook students who have been nominated to participate in this program next year, could you please stand up? And last but not least, I want to thank Ivana Barisic for helping me with all the logistics to make this weekend happen. So, yay. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Deborah Obalil. Thank you, Amy, and thanks to everyone here at Cranbrook for continuing to host the ACAD Postgraduate Teaching Fellows Gathering, as we call it. Um, it's really a great time for, for us to get to meet all the fellows, for the fellows to meet each other and hopefully make um, long-lasting connections and bonds. I know that many of the first-year fellows are still in touch with each other and they stay in touch with me, which I think is, uh, I love. It's great to hear what they're doing. It's my pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker, um, Dr. Dory Tunstall, who is currently Dean of the Faculty of Design at uh, OCAD University in Toronto, Canada. Um, she joined uh, OCAD back in August of 2016 and was just telling me there's now a new dean of research, so she's not the new dean anymore. So she's very, that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> um, and previous to being at OCAD, she held positions at Swinburne University of Technology in Australia. Um, and uh, she is described as a design leader, professional design anthropologist, advocate, and ad educator. Uh, and I'm going to leave my introduction there because Dory and I were speaking before, and she's really going to walk you through a lot more of that and expound upon um, all the different aspects of her work and her career in her uh, remarks. So with that, I invite Dory. Only because the podium is taller than I am. <laughs> um, so um, first, thank you so very much for this uh, invitation. I am so thrilled to be here. Like, uh, first of all, Cranbrook is like a legendary place um, in terms of uh, art and design education. And so to actually be here at the mothership is really exciting. And it's also really exciting for me to be able to uh, speak with all of you. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about respectful design. And it's really going to be going through the five iterations of my life in design anthropology. Um, and it's framed this way because uh, one of the things, or two of the things I think that are really important um, about um, the life of 
the mind as well as the life of making um, is to convey to people the iterative nature of the things that you think of and the things that you propose. Um, and also to, um, to talk about how the context around the work that you do, um, again, reshapes your thoughts, reshapes your practices, reshapes your theory. Um, so I'm gonna, the structure around this is gonna be very similar. I'm gonna introduce to you a concept of design anthropology. I'm gonna contextualize it within a moment in my career and the communities in with um, whom I were engaged. And then I'm gonna give a small, really brief practical application of it because one of the things that's really important um, in my work as design anthropologist is um, actually testing things out in the real world. Um, so the first iteration of design anthropology, and yes, I will eventually get to defining design anthropology, um, but again, it moves. Uh, the first iteration of design anthropology I call yin yang. Um, and at the time, around 2004 through 2006, I was heavily involved in studying Tai Chi. And I was studying Tai Chi for a really important reason. Uh, I had physically a, uh, uh, a heart arrhythmia, and I was having fainting spells. Uh, and so the doctor says that's because you are too stressed out. <laughs> and the way in which to manage the stress was begin to take Tai Chi. Um, and again, being sort of uh, the person that I am, that I was not interested in just doing the movements, right, but actually understanding the theory, and in particularly the Taoist theory that underpins uh, Tai Chi as a practice. And then, again, being the master synthesizer of information and practice, I realized it was a really great way to talk about the relationship between design and anthropology. So, concept. The yin yang of design anthropology. So again, if you're not familiar with sort of Tai Chi and Taoism, um, the key sort of concepts has to do with this notion that there's two kind of energies in the world um, that are in harmonious dynamic relationship to one another. Uh, yin energy, which is about sort of internal uh, thinking, closing, bending, retreating, and so in the move that goes with this with Tai Chi, um, it's actually expressed as rollback. So it's just like, right? I'm letting everything come to me, and I'm just accepting. Uh, that then uh, works in dynamic harmony with Yang energy, which is about being external, acting, open, extending, advancing being big, and the motion that goes with that is, uh, well, push and then press, and I'll show you that. So push, let me get that out. If you're being really forceful, press. So, as I said, I was doing a lot of Tai Chi. Uh, at the time, I was really disciplined in doing it the three times, three times a day that you're supposed to do it um, in order to gain mastery. And um, again, the context around this is I was in transition. So I had been working as experience planner at ARC Worldwide. I was then managing director of Design for Democracy and then transitioning into becoming an associate professor of design anthropology at University of Illinois at Chicago. And the context around this was um, at the time figuring out What's the relationship between designers and be the relationship between anthropologists? Uh, figuring out how does the work that I do apply to the context of commercial uh, clients like, I don't know, uh, Northern Trust <laughs> of, uh, versus working uh, for the government versus trying to figure out how do you convey this knowledge to the next generation of practitioners. And so figuring out what the relationship is between these two types of energy in the world became really important in terms of trying to define uh, what community I was trying to build around those hybrid practices of design and anthropology. 
Um, so again, it's all about dealing with the complexity of being a professional designer, being a professional anthropologist, uh, understanding that those skills are not separate but integrated, but also again, having lots of competition around this term um, ethnographer and who's the best type of ethnographer um, within that. And so again, I'm being about harmony, uh, wanted to talk about, well, actually we need to cultivate both skills, right? We need to be both yin and yang. Um, and that our ability to balance that harmonious relationship between sort of when we're receiving information, when we're listening, when we're being empathetic versus when we're trying to make change, right? We're trying to design change. Uh, the relationship between that is how we become a progressive force for business, for government, and for society. Um, and so the application of this uh, was actually a presentation that I gave at the Ethnographic Praxis and Conference, um, Ethnographic Praxis and Industry Conference, and where I had taken the kinds of deliverables that were produced kind of in user experience, user research, user strategy. Um, uh, for those who are in those fields, they may be familiar, but things like personas and scenarios, giving electronic presentations, preparing posters, having conversations, doing video, modeling experiences like user journeys, doing opportunity matrices and experience metrics, which is sort of um, putting a dollar price to whatever opportunities that you create and see how much people are willing to pay for that. Um, all of those things to begin to talk about that in terms of a whether it's, again, this soft force of listening, trying to persuade people, uh, those who are in uh, positions of higher decision making than you are, um, versus, again, trying to be more forceful about it, being more impacting the decision in a very direct way. Um, it was really important to map the way in which we practice so that at the time as ethnographers uh, or ethnographers in training as my students were being, that we could be more strategic around what impact that we wanted to make, whether again that was working with the government or working with industry or, um, or working with communities. And so the application of that is identifying what it is that we do and what energy we could be using in order to be more successful and um, impactful in how we're doing it. But then I had kind of made the transition completely to UIC and I was, you know, I go and I prepare for my students, okay, we're gonna do the yin yang of design anthropology, and they say to me, that's too abstract, I don't know, have any idea what you're talking about, can you break it down for me? So the next iteration is Kwame. Um, and it comes from this book that I read by Alan Bernard uh, that describes theory as being made up of a set of questions, assumptions, methods, and evidence. Um, so again, the context around this is I'm an associate professor now of design anthropology at UIC. Um, again, this continues into my move down under to Australia where I'm an associate professor of design anthropology at Swinburne University. Um, and I'm working on interdisciplinary teams with interdisciplinary products. So the photo here is a meeting of the interdisciplinary product development class which was made up of uh, students from uh, business, students from engineering, and students from design. And so Kwame becomes a framework to talk about um, some really interesting things. First, break down barriers between academics and practitioners uh, to be able to talk about the similarities and differences in how they build and use knowledge, right? So we all have a set of questions we ask, we all have a set of assumptions, definitely have a set of assumptions. Uh, we have methods that we prefer, and then we have preferred evidence uh, that is persuasive that you know what you're talking about when you uh, framed your question, right? Um, it's also really important um, that it's uh, grounded in a shared systemic analytical process 
Um, so this is the part where the students are saying, can you break it down for me in a way that I can use this as a framework for the research I might want to do or to um, analyze and evaluate something that already exists. Um, and again, because I'm trying to communicate to students at this time, I needed to present it in a language they understand. So, and we all understand music videos and songs. I'm not gonna play the entire part of it. You'll have to like Google me on YouTube possible? Google me on YouTube um, in order to find the full video. Um, but it gives you kind of a sense of, of the playfulness around these sort of engagements, but also the importance of, again, communicating um, in a way that students really began to understand. Yeah, I've got a question. Besides my homage to Pam Greer and black exploitation films, um, it was really about like again any of my students, and I show this most of the time to my students. Like they'll go around singing questions, assumptions, methods, and evidence, baby, right? Q any of me always got Kwame. Now you guys are all remembering it, um, and 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 it's embedded right, in the way that they think about things. It's embedded when they're having conversations with someone from another discipline, right? They could be like, okay, we're having a little bit of friction now. Are we asking the same question? Okay, maybe we're doing that. Are we making the same assumptions? Uh, that's normally where the problem lies is people are coming with things at a different assumptions. Uh, again, the methods allow you to really think about, um, can we create hybrid methods? Um, and then again, evidence, how are we gonna convince the different audiences that we know what we know? And all of my students who've worked with me over the years, like they now have that in their head, like a beautiful earworm. <laughs> And so, again, the application of this is really, um, again, about being very practical. So what is it that I've done in anthropology? What is it that you do in design? What is it that you do in design research? What is it that is design anthropology that is distinct from all of these other practices? So again, uh, if design, if anthropology is what does it mean to be human, and design is how I design a successful artifact, then again, design anthropology becomes that intersection between how do these processes and artifacts help define what it means to be human. Um, if we have different assumptions about how the world work, how do we kind of bring those together? Again, the methods uh, are often uh, combinations of it, and again, evidence, 
we have different ways of convincing each other. So if we're not convinced, then perhaps we need to give it a different form. And so I was writing on the Kwame tip for a really long time. Uh, but then I kind of um, always was thinking about um, that there's something deeper that I wanted to do with, with that, probably going back to those notions of yin yang. And so it's really, then I started talking about design anthropology as a relationship between values, design, and experience. Um, and it comes from, I've always used two definitions of design anthropology depending on whom I'm talking to. So if I'm talking uh, to a group of designers, then I talk about how design translates values into tangible experiences. If I'm talking to a bunch of sort of social scientists, then I say, well, how are the um, artifacts and processes of design help define what it means to be human. So again, like being a hybrid design anthropologist, I often, I, in my own conceptualization of design anthropology, understand that there's different um, concerns uh, for different audiences that I needed to reflect even in the way in which I talk about the practice of design anthropology. And so, uh, some of the things that distinguish uh, design anthropology as values, design, and experience is that, like again, in this kind of loop that you have, that you know, understanding values, that's very much anthropology. Uh, the relationship between design and experience, that might be anywhere from usability uh, to um, design research. Uh, that iterative practice, practice between sort of understanding experience and how that loops back to design. Again, it's part of sort of design research. Um, but what defines kind of design anthropology is that loop back of saying, hmm, maybe we need to go all the way back to that rearticulation of values. Um, if there's not an alignment between the design and the experience, it may not just be the issue of the design, it might be an issue of the values as well. And so what happens if we go back and we pick out different values or we find out what the expression is of those values are different and then loop that through another design and experience evaluation process. And so that's kind of how design anthropology as a project sort of distinguishes itself from other similar practices. And again, context around this uh, is still teaching, <laughs> um, but moving deeper into uh, trying to understand actually what is the value of democracy. So this is where I'm working not just in terms of the let's design better ballots in terms of design anthropology, but how do we design better policies around um, democracy and the way in which design facilitates democracy through my work with Design for Democracy at the time and then building up the US National Design Policy Initiative that I wanted to understand deeply what is this value, this human value of democracy and again, what are the ways in which we make that tangible through the things that we create? And then what are the experiences people are having? Um, and then what's the video for this one? Uh, <laughs> uh, so this is kind of, again, I, I grew up in the 1980s, so like my language of expression is music videos because I grew up on MTV, uh, yeah. Um, and so, again, I needed a music video to communicate uh, what these ideals might be. Design translates values into tangible experience. What are your values? Values seek the anthros difference. Yeah, I've mastered the rap the aesthetic. The what? Experience. 
application of this was directly with the work I was doing with the U.S. National Design Policy Initiative. Um, and uh, the image that you see is the mapping of all the tangible ways in which the professional design associations, uh, the design education bodies, and the different bodies in the federal government uh, were um, engaged in, in processes of supporting um, democracy through design. Um, so looking at sort of design for economic competitiveness and design for democratic governance and literally mapping um, how those activities broke down. And again, all of this really about striving to understand what is the value of democracy um, and what does it mean, especially in these days, uh, uh, to for people to not experience democracy and how design can actually help in um, making them feel that they're living in a democratic um, country. And so um, I moved to Australia. And there I uh, had to shift again my way of thinking about design anthropology. Or not shift, I think just further evolve thoughts that were already there, but weren't qu quite articulated in the way in which they needed to be. So the next iteration of design anthropology was an articulation of seven principles. And the seven principles are kind of a breakdown of, okay, you, you have values, design, and experience, but how do you approach them? How do you approach understanding values? How do you approach the process of designing? How do you approach the evaluation of experience in a way that is ethical, in a way that is what I will talk about more respectful, um, and in a way that is part of a process of decolonization. So in this, I propose seven principles of design anthropology, uh, very much theoretically driven in terms of lots of readings, um, two particular readings um, that are important, the work of uh, Cuban anthropologist uh, Fernando Ortiz, who talks about uh, transculturation. Um, and that's just a theory of change that says when cultures come together, three things can happen. Um, there's cultural loss or deculturation, there's cultural gain, um, assimilation, and then there's the creating of things that are completely new, neoculturation. Um, so thinking about this dynamic process of cultural change, how do you then combine that with the sense of, of ethics, of how you approach um, values, design, and experience? And uh, again, the context is, is the Australian context and working for the first time with um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, creative designers and artists and being deeply engaged in their processes of decolonization and addressing the question that they're asking me, like anthropology as a field has a, <laughs> a pretty intense colonial history. So them questioning me saying, how is it that what you're doing is going to contribute to our process of liberation, our process of emancipation, our process of decolonization, and having to come up with a, a genuine and authentic answer to that um, 
not just by myself, but in concert with, um, with them. Um, and so kind of the crystallization of this was this culture space innovation initiative. And so um, in 2011, uh, I had written a grant to the Rockefeller Foundation um, Bellagio Center to bring together, I think, uh, 21 uh, indigenous activist um, scholars, designers, anthropologists, computer scientists, a variety of people, all trying to figure out, again, what is this role, this relationship between culture and design and innovation and how it could be part of a process of decolonization. And so this kind of helped ground uh, this definition of design anthropology from critical anthropology of third world peoples, um, indigenous as well as Scandinavian traditions of cooperative and participatory design, um, and indigenous critical and feminist ontological and phenomenological um, knowledge traditions. And the application of this kind of expands tremendously. Um, the, uh, the group of cultures-based innovation, we've met every two years, except we skipped this year because I was starting a new position at OCAD University, so I didn't have the bandwidth. Um, but this year in October, we're going to hold our next symposium in um, China. And I'm hoping that'll be the first uh, of our uh, cultures-based innovation uh, meetings that will be um, conducted in Chinese. <laughs> so our second one was in uh, Fakatani, New Zealand, and we were hosted by Maori community. Um, the uh, last one that we had in 2015 was at the BAM Center in Canada. Um, and again, very much hosted by the um, indigenous uh, strategic thinking um, and leadership uh, team um, at Banff. Um, so deeply engaged with sort of indigenous perspectives. And again, uh, the theme of trying to figure out how the relationship to design, anthropology, um, and innovation um, and indigenous knowledge can be part of a process of decolonization. But the particular application I'm gonna talk about is the work that I was doing in India in 2015. Cause there's a video that comes with it. <laughs> um, so in 2015, as part of a, a, a grant that I received from the Vinogren Foundation, I got to spend a month leading an intensive design workshop with Indian design and anthropology students from all over India. Um, and it was trying to figure out in some ways, like India has its own traditions in terms of the intersection of culture and design and innovation. And so it was trying to figure out, like if we gave that a label of design anthropology, what would design anthropology need to be to be um, appropriate and useful to the Indian context? Um, and so we uh, went to uh, southern Gujarat near the beach because uh, it was very hot in the summer, and but it was also mango season, so it was quite tolerable. Um, <laughs> and uh, we worked with uh, a community of artisans to really understand not just how we could design for them, uh, but how we could um, design with them to address some of the challenges that they're facing um, in their community um, in terms of being able to continue to do the types of work that they want to do, right? The economic pressures of, do I continue my embroidery work or do I go work construction because I can get paid more money to do construction building a road than doing the practices that I'm used to? Um, I like the electricity that is provided by the power plant that's down the street, but it's actually, uh, uh, we're pastorists, right? So it's killing our, you know, our stock uh, through pollution. So re working with the community to understand um, their challenges and work with them to design solutions to express those challenges, but also um, to give them tools to help solve the challenges for themselves.
And so um, this is, um, so because it was in southern um, uh, Gujarat, uh, the culture, one of the major cultural practices there is the garba dance. Um, and so we uh, created a song to express what it is that the students learned uh, using the traditional garba. Um, and so we recorded it, we filmed it, we, as you see, we'll do a lot of dancing. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful kind of articulation um, from an Indian context of what this, the combination of design and anthropology as part of a uh, emancipatory practice um, would mean for them. So now I move to the last, well, latest iteration, which is a respectful design and the work that I'm doing at OCAD University as the first black and black female dean of a faculty of design anywhere. Um, uh, in a more uh, academic sense, uh, respectful design is really kind of combining three ideals. Um, Richard Sinnott's ideal of respect, uh, which is about the mutual recognition and the intrinsic worth of everything and um, treating um, everything with dignity and regard. Um, Herbert Simon's notion of design, um, the creation of preferred courses of action, and I just love um, uh, South Korean graphic designer Ahn Song Soo's uh, life peace symbol as kind of a visualization of all of those things together. Um, so again, I've been at OCAD for a year and September, October, November, December, January, four months, five months, almost five months. Um, but one of the things that was really important to me is to help, um, and say rebrand is probably the best words, the, 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 the work around design for humanity uh, that was part of the DNA of OCAD University as a faculty of design and was part of the reason why I was attracted to the institution. Because it's like in other places I've been, I've tried, I've had to bring that design anthropological perspective, but they already had it there. So it's just a matter of like trying to redefine it in a way that is um, fresh, um, but also in a way that takes into account indigenous ways of knowing. Um, and so respectful design uh, was a way to begin to articulate that. But one of the things that's really important for me and my leadership is to kind of work bottom up as well as top down. Um, and so <laughs> two weeks upon arrival, uh, we put together this World Cafe uh, workshop uh, where three questions, um, 
What does respectful design mean to you as an individual? What does respectful design mean to each of their, your programs? And so at OCAD, we have six undergraduate programs, uh, illustration, graphic design, industrial design, material art and design, uh, advertising, and graphic design, environmental design. Um, and then lastly, what does respectful design uh, need to mean for the faculty itself? And because, um, okay, so uh, OK University uh, faculty design is one of the largest <laughs> anywhere. Uh, about 2,400 students just in the faculty of design. Uh, about uh, 95 to 100 full-time faculty and 150 uh, sessional faculty. Um, that's just to say I can't get all my faculty into a room <laughs> together. Uh, so um, the way in which we documented uh, everyone's contributions is we did little short videos of like 20 seconds, 30 seconds, et cetera, et cetera. And then we then put this together into a video, because again, my language is that of the music video, right? Uh, we put together a video to kind of articulate what our uh, vision was for the faculty design. The first version of it was terrible, like it was horrible sound, the lighting was terrible, so then again, we have a media and communication team, so they put together a really, really nice video, so I'm going to show you that one. At OCAD University Faculty Design, we practice what we call respectful design. Respectful design, what does it mean to the faculty of design? It means valuing inclusivity and people's cultures and ways of knowing through empathetic and responsible creative methodologies. It means deepening our relationships to the lives of materials and the craft of making. The challenge facing design today is really to reestablish the relationship with nature, in other words, to design ourselves back into the environment. For example, adding the indigenous concept of seven generations to inform sustainable design. Good design takes a certain amount of humility. We have to recognize that we can do harm as well as good. It's about need over want. Respectful design means acknowledging different values different manners of production, and different ways of knowing. The widest possible range of diversity with respect to ability, language, culture, and beyond. Designing futures with inclusion and belonging for everyone. Come join us here at OCAD University's Faculty of Design and find out what respectful design means to you. becomes all important because uh, last January, not this recent January, but the January before, uh, in our academic plan at OK University, we uh, decided as a community that our first principle in our academic plan is decolonization. Um, and that relates to, again, bringing um, indigenous perspectives into our curriculum, uh, trying to address the, um, we moved away from the language of a Western bias or Eurocentric bias um, to uh, basically removing aspects of the modernist project from design. Because the modernist project, which in the context of Europe was quite liberatory uh, in sort of saying, okay, let's, get rid of all these ethnic markers, for example, that has led Europe to conflict with one another for thousands and thousands of years, right? And so we have these clean, modern designs uh, that, re that recognize the unity of all people. Um, let's use technology to um, basically create progress. And by progress, we mean providing um, everyone with the same opportunities and lifestyles of the aristocracy. Um, so those things which in the context of Europe were quite liberatory when it travels around the world to places like Canada um, become the practices of colonization, right? So let's erase your 
uh, Native American, uh, First Nation, Inuit, Métis identities for you to join Universal Man, who just happens to look like a European and believe everything that Europeans do. Um, let's use technology to build a better life on your land using your labor <laughs> um, and taking your resources, right? So, um, so for us, decolonization is really about trying to decouple the processes of making and design from this modernist project. So it's not about Europe. I've been, I spent the summer in Europe and they're, they've moved away from, in some ways, that project in and of themselves. Um, it's not Western versus non-Western. It's really that belief uh, that the only way in which we can move forward is by leaving our um, identities behind um, and that technology always points the best way forward. Um, leaving those things behind might provide us an opportunity to move forward in a harmonious way. Um, second principle is diversity and equity, but I think we, uh, many institutions, they talk about that. So I've, I've yet to meet another institution um, of design or anyone that has decolonization as its first principle. Um, and again, I think it means different things. This is the you know really important thing. If you have um, in the colonial encounter um, the native, the slave, the settler, uh, that they all have different positions. And this is not tied to identities. It's tied to positions, right? That one has. And so decolonization means from our First Nations, Inuit, and Métis uh, colleagues, it's like repatriation of visual sovereignty and, and serving an allyship to everyone else. Uh, for those whose heritage is, is um, tied to slavery, it's about um, the abolition of exploitative relationships over labor. Um, and then being an ally to other struggles and for settlers, it's really um, a generative uh, process of trying to create an identity of whiteness that's not reliant on white supremacy. Um, and so those are kind of the three processes at OCAD University that we're undergoing. So I uh, organized a, um, a small round table on whiteness without white supremacy. <laughs> Um, again, I'm leading a black youth design initiative uh, to address kind of the, the impact of anti-black racism on um, youth and what that means in terms of them seeing themselves having a future in design. Um, and OCAD University for 10 years has had the Indigenous Visual Cultural Center. Um, and so it has a strong community around um, building competency in visual sovereignty. And we're just trying to catch up uh, in design because we only have uh, one uh, faculty member who's not even a tenure, tenure track faculty member uh, who's of indigenous heritage. And he was in the video, he was speaking uh, Métis, uh, the language of the Métis people. Um, and, so, uh, and so he's helping to begin to facilitate uh, what does it mean to, to create visual sovereignty? What does it mean to bring indigenous principles like uh, the seven grandfather teachings or seven generations into as the foundation for, um, in this case, uh, the industrial design uh, curriculum? And I'm going to skip that. And again, just, you know, that the students lead the way. Um, the students are already engaged in projects where they're exploring the boundaries of their identities and how, what role they play in design theory as well as design practice. And our job is really to just get out of their way, um, to support them where they feel that they uh, need support, um, and to make it I mean, I think the simplest way to talk about decolonization for me is um, to create the conditions in which um, our students, our black, indigenous, and sort of people of color students 
do not feel like they have to choose between their identities and being a designer. And right now, they feel like they have to choose, right? If you come from an Indian aesthetic where you uh, use every available space to put some design on it, and your professor is telling you, you need more white space, you need more white space, you need more white space, right? Because there's an aesthetic expectation around that. Then the message that student here is that you can't come from that Indian cultural heritage that values a different aesthetic and be a designer. And so my job is to get rid of the institutional barriers um, that prevents um, our students from being able to bring themselves fully as themselves into design education and into design practice um, and into design theory for those who are wanting to do um, research. And so all of these things, as you can see, are deeply, deeply intertwined. Like I haven't moved beyond the yin yang of design anthropology. It's just that the different communities that I've engaged with have asked me to clarify or explain or to provide them with frameworks and tools um, in different ways that have asked me to redefine it, to reiterate, to refine, to better crystallize. Um, the ideals of what it means to bring together culture and design. Um, because going back to sort of that original yin yang is that if you have the ability to deeply understand and receive from others the environment, to receive from other people, to receive the energy of all those things, and then you have that ability to transform that energy into something that gives back, in a way, harmoniously. Like, design and anthropology puts together like all the superpowers that you need um, in order to be a respectful, um, ethical, compassionate, harmonious, dynamic, uh, creator, maker, um, designer um, in the world. So thank you for listening. <laughs>